But in terms of nutrition in the field that we're in, we like to think about diet as the pattern of food in which you eat. That's not associated with weight loss, but it's associated with working to give yourself health and nutrition throughout your dietary intake. So you may hear me call it a diet. You may hear me call it a dietary pattern, but that's sort of the idea that I want you to think about that. This would be a way of life. Um, something that you would continue doing. So, what is a plant based diet? As I just said, it's really difficult to define because there are so many different definitions and oftentimes plant based. Plant based has a little bit of trickiness when it comes to the media and working in nutrition is 1 of the toughest jobs because there is so much misinformation out there. So we do our best to clarify that misinformation into what it means to be a vegetarian, what it means to be plant based. What are the health benefits and also what are the myths that are involved in that? So we'll kind of talk about all of those things in this presentation. So right now, if you look up a plant based diet and you find a reputable resource, which sometimes takes me all the way to the 3rd page of Google to find something that I trust because there are a as I mentioned, just a lot of misinformation out there. So always looking for websites that are a .org or a .edu coming from these reputable universities and research institutions. So when we talk about a plant-based diet, that's really looking at the consumption of the food as a whole. So looking at whole fruits and vegetables, whole legumes, um, I'm down here on the third bullet, peas, lentils, soybeans, seeds, and nuts. So it's going to be the idea of eating the whole food rather than processed food. So, and processing would be changing corn on the cob into cream corn, for example. And while they may be somewhat nutritionally similar, the processing does often add stabilizers and a lot of sodium. So in this plant based diet, it's going to have a large amount of nutrient dense plant food, which we're going to talk about what nutrient dense and energy dense means and the difference between following this plant based diet um, in terms of whole food consumption. So basically what the definitions are saying now for plant based versus vegetarian is that plant based is consuming these whole foods while vegetarian may be still incorporating processing of foods and oils. Again, we'll talk about all of the definitions. So the, the big take home here is that there are a lot of differing opinions on what this actually means. And pretty much the take home is it's gonna be individualized to you. One of the ideas that we have in nutrition is removing items from the diet that are not nutritionally um, required, so not medically required, such as an allergy, we don't really agree with. So the idea that if you want to be plant-based, you make it what works for you. You don't have to follow any rules. You can make it what works for you. And Sajel can talk about that later and her incorporation of seafood into her plant-based diet. All right. So ooh, hold on. Let's get to our next size. Okay. So before we start about this, we're going to talk more about the suggested healthy eating pattern. So evidence based nutrition research is what we always want to provide. So saying that there is lots of different nutritional studies that's showing this is what makes up a quote healthy diet. And this is what is shown to one meet our nutritional needs. So meeting all of our micronutrient deficiency requirements to avoid deficiency and two to meet our caloric needs. So you can think about nutrition in two ways that you a just need basic fuel in your body and B, what quality of fuel? So you can think about it as putting like unleaded plus or super plus into your body, basically. At the end of the day, it's all gas, but what level of gas do you wanna put in? So a healthy diet is comprised, and you're gonna be like, yep, I know this, a variety, balance, nutrient and energy adequacy and moderation. And while we all know what comprises a healthy diet, are we meeting those needs of healthy diets? And in my courses, we do a lot of introspection. So a lot of actually looking at diets, this is the same with any client or patient that I see, actually looking at the diet and think, am I really doing all of these things that I know are healthy? Or am I just saying, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Now I know what I'm doing. 
So really be honest with yourself in nutrition. That's one of the best ways to really know if you are having that healthy dietary pattern. So to talk about plant-based diets, we really have to look into the definition of nutrient versus energy density. Because one of the hallmarks of plant-based diets is that they are traditionally lower in calories, just because vegetables, which provide a lot of the nutrition in a plant-based diet, are very low in calories. And we're thinking about that in our sort of fuel tank ability that we have to take in X amount of calories per day. So when we talk about nutrient density, that's going to be the nutrient content of a food, meaning how much nutrients. And when we think about nutrients, the definition of that would be something that our body needs to get from the diet to basically function properly. And without those nutrients, we'll have deficiency symptoms. And when we add the nutrients back in, those deficiency symptoms will be resolved. That's the definition of nutrient essentiality. So with nutrient content, we're looking for protein, vitamins, and minerals compared to the calories. So if the food is 200 calories and 25% of that food is made up of proteins, vitamins, and minerals, that's going to be a low nutrient content food. But if you have a 200 calorie food where 75% of it is made up of protein, vitamins, and minerals, that's going to be a higher nutrient density food. So the foods that typically fall under the highest level of nutrient density are going to be whole fruits and whole vegetables. And guess what that also comprises? The whole food-based diet and the protein-based, or excuse me, the plant-based diet. So that is sort of the basis of why this dietary pattern may be chosen. So take a minute to test your nutrient density knowledge here and think about which has a greater nutrient density, 10 ounces of soda or 10 ounces of milk. Anyone in the chat box want to take a guess here? Which has a higher nutrient density? Oh, chat box guesses. <laughs> Yeah, one guess. Thanks, Amy. Milk. All right. Sajil Sun says milk. All right, we have two guesses and you both are correct. So milk is going to be the more nutrient dense choice. If we look up at the top here, fat free eight ounces of milk, and <laughs> Stella agrees. You have a genius one year old over there, Vanessa and uh, eight ounces of this soda, they provide roughly the same calories. So we call that a caloric equivalent. And when we have two items that are calorically matched, we dive deeper into the nutrients. We see over here on the right, you can see my mouse moving, right? Yeah, okay. We see over here on the right that it is a rich source of protein, multiple vitamins. These are fat soluble, also water soluble B vitamins, as well as minerals, calcium and iron. So while if you're just looking to get calories on your, to fill up your fuel tank, either provide you, this has that added benefit of all of those nutrients in the milk over the soda. So compared to that, we also have foods that we would call empty calories, which is essentially what that soda would be here. And again, I'm not saying that soda in moderation is soda in moderation, absolutely fine. Just something to consider when you're looking at that total calorie count. So soda would fall under empty calories, meaning that it has very low nutrient density. So it could be maybe 2% having protein, vitamins, or minerals compared to the total calories of 200, for example. These foods are usually higher in sugar and fat, but have few additional nutrients in them. So therefore the calories are quote empty because they're not providing any nutrition. However, they are adding to the total caloric count. So, and that's fine as long as we're staying within our range of required calories per day. And unfortunately, the best foods fall within the empty calorie foods, such as soda, chips, cookies, and candy. It's a cruel world out there. The other definition is going to be energy density. So that's looking at the calories or energy per gram of a food compared to the total weight of the food. So think about how much a food weighs, and then we'll consider how much total energy is in that. So an energy dense food can be high in calories, but weigh very little. 
And the tough part about energy density is it can be healthy or unhealthy depending on the source. So for example, olive oil can be very heavy or it can be very light depending on how much you add, but it has a lot of nutrients within versus an equivalently weighted cookie, which may have little to no nutritional value, but is the same weight as something else. So they will be equivalent energy density. So that gets a little bit trickier. So let's break it down into very low energy dense foods and high energy dense foods. So when we think about very low energy density, that's not gonna be providing very many calories. So look what falls on that list. Lettuce, tomatoes, broccoli, fruits. It has a high water content compared to the other nutrients. So when you have these very low energy dense foods, in order to reach your calorie maximum for the day, you have to eat a lot of these. And sometimes I say you have to eat a lot, but sometimes I say you get to eat a lot. So one of the things that we recommend to clients is if you're somebody who likes to eat a large volume of food, focusing on those low energy dense foods allows you to consume a lot. You can have so much broccoli, one of my favorites. So comparatively, we have our high energy dense foods, and these are foods that will provide you a lot of calories in a little package. So we think about our nuts and seeds, which we would typically list as a healthy food, but within, I think it's like eight almonds is 200 calories. So it's great if you wanna have an energy dense snack, but once I was counseling somebody who was eating two cups of cashews a night, and she's coming in saying, I'm not understanding, like I can't lose weight, here's my dietary intake, her whole day looked good. And then when I found out she was eating two cups of cashews, which was equivalent to almost 2000 calories, I was like, whoa, this is the problem here because this is a very energy dense food. There's a lot of calories packed into a little package. So looking along those lines and how these things can be healthy or not. So this is one of my favorite pictures showing again, two calorically matched meals. So each one of these meals is 535 calories. So you can just take a minute, like let's say you have 535 calories to spend at lunch, which meal would you prefer to have? And there's not a right or wrong answer to this. It's just the balance and the moderation and the variety of your diet. And that's what goes into deciding what sort of a dietary pattern you'd want to follow. So over here on the left, you've got many, many different types of foods, many different types of nutrients. And if you're really into having a full sandwich and a soup and fruit and yogurt all for one meal, or if you're not really into eating that much food, but you know you need the calories, this is a much smaller portion of food. So it all goes into those decisions that you make every day. So now we'll do another little quiz on here which is the most nutrient dense of these three foods now note that all of these foods that you see here are 200 calories so we have a fourth a cup of cashews two cups of grapes or about a half cup of raisins does anyone on the chat want to guess which is the most nutrient dense food you got to guess cashews okay anybody else Nancy to call in. Oh, we've got over, oh, oh, grapes, cashews. Okay. So when we're talking about nutrient density, it's going to be the most nutrients that you can get per weight of the food. And the answer is grapes. Oops, hold on. No, Nancy, you may not annotate my presentation at this time. So the reason the answer is grapes is because you can eat the most amount of grapes for the most calories. So, and that's when you think about nutrient density, again, it's going to be, you can have two cups of grapes, which is the largest amount of food for 200 calories. All right. So what about, which is the most energy dense? And so this would be the most energy for 200 calories which would provide you the most calories or the most calories per amount of food? Any guesses here? Cashews, 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 cashews. Good job, guys, you got it, cashews. 
And maybe that's because I gave that example, but definitely you can eat a small amount of cashews to get that 200 calories. So that's why nuts are such a great choice for a snack. And you think like, oh, only eight, but it is something that if you're on the run, you need a quick boost of energy, it's a really good choice. If you eat two cups of grapes, you're gonna be hungry in probably 30 minutes. So that's not gonna provide you nearly the same amount of energy. So these are all building into the difference between plant-based and animal-based diets. So the dietary pattern that's recommended for Americans is the my plate and falls within these categories. So you wanna make half your plate fruits and vegetables, have a good serving of grains, preferably whole grains, and then have those lean proteins as well as a dairy component. And dairy, of course, doesn't have to be in the form of milk. Actually, the my plate is being changed. So this is going to be a cup of water and then dairy will fall on the plate as well. Cause you know, I love cheese and cheese is definitely an important part of my diet. So when we're looking at these recommendations, it does suggest to have grains, vegetables, fruit, dairy, protein from animal-based products and having all of that in moderation. And that's based on the research and the body's needs for where this comes from. Uh, that's the general guideline. So just giving you an example of what it would be before choosing a different dietary pattern. All right, so that leads us into why do individuals choose a different dietary pattern? And Sage, I'll make a note of this because I definitely want you to speak to why you've chosen to follow the dietary pattern that you have. There are many different reasons why people choose to do it. Um, Typically, when vegetarian diets came onto the scenes in the 70s, it was associated with religious followings. So certain religions who do follow vegetarian patterns, uh, then as it kind of evolved more philosophical ideas of animal well-being and treatment sort of came into the picture. And now we're concerned from an ecological and um, greenhouse and global warming perspective and the use of animal products and how much that weighs on our economy. So there are many different factors why people choose these. Um, what I'll pretty much be focusing on when it comes from nutrition, and that's again, where I'm usually coming from, is for health related reasons. So why would you make the choice to take on this dietary pattern for health reasons and what are the potential benefits and what are the potential setbacks? All right, so here is an overview. Um, I'll talk about this in words, but of the varying different types of dietary patterns. And we know we live in a world now where this is definitely not an exhaustive list. Um, all the other fad diets are for a different day. Although again, remember from the nutrition field perspective, we don't agree with the removal of nutrients from the diet, unless it is for medical reasons or for a true dislike. So we will be looking at these patterns here and seeing what has been removed from them. So I will talk about each one of these. So first we have vegan and vegan is total vegetarian, excluding all animal products. And that's the animal products that are kind of on the borderline for what's included or excluded is eggs and dairy. So what has kind of come, and I want you to know the difference between vegan, vegetarian, and plant-based is this last part here, the inclusion of whole foods, restricted fat, or refined sugar. So an individual following a vegan diet removes these animal-based products, but there's no requirement in, requirement in the dietary pattern for removal of fat or refined sugar or processed foods. That's not in the guidelines of being a vegan. There's also a subset of that called raw food vegan, and this is the same, but the foods are cooked, uh, any food cooked above 118 degrees is removed from this diet. So as practitioners, we start to get a little worried when there are a lot of restrictions on a diet, because we know from science that restrictions on a diet are increase the odds that there is something underlying um, disordered eating for restriction, as well as the inability to follow or retain this diet for a long period of time. So if somebody is doing this for weight loss, it may be sustainable for four to six weeks. And after that, people say, I can't not handle eating 
cooked food anymore, and then they go off the diet, and then the weight comes back, and now we have a yo-yo diet situation. So that's why these diets are typically guided against. Next, we have a lacto-vegetarian, and this, again, is the removal of all animal products. However, it includes milk products. So that would be dairy products in there. But not all dairy products, I should say, it's specific to milk products. And we have the prefix lacto coming from lactose, because dairy would include um, eggs. So then we have our oval vegetarians, which is going to be the removal of all of the animal products, including dairy, but includes eggs. Gotta have my eggs. Then we have our lacto oval vegetarian, which would be the inclusion of eggs and dairy products, along with those uh, exclusion of animal based meat products. We also have a Mediterranean style pattern, which is quite similar to our whole foods approach, but it does allow small amounts of chicken, dairy products, eggs and red meat, but very sparingly once or twice a month. And the Mediterranean style dietary pattern has been shown to be the healthiest dietary pattern that you can follow. Um, that's coming from data that the lowest level of chronic disease is happening within the Mediterranean region. And that's been pretty well documented for about the 20, the last 20 years or so. Um, but note the last part of that bullet, which is fish and olive oil are encouraged and fat is not restricted because butter and olive oil, wine and fish consumption are big parts of this Mediterranean diet. All right, and that leads us to our whole food, plant-based, low-fat diet, which is what we're going to move into next, talking about foods in their whole form, especially fruits, vegetable, legumes, seeds, and nuts. But of course, that little bit of caveat on seeds and nuts because they are so energy dense. So this is limiting animal products, but notice how it doesn't say avoid or exclude. And it does um, recommend total fat being reduced. So what I realized I didn't have on here though, Sajel, and you can talk about that later, is pescatarian which would be following a plant-based or vegetarian diet and including seafood. All right, so I wanted to start off by showing the difference between vegan plant-based diet and whole food plant-based diet. Again, as I mentioned, there are a lot of restrictions. So what you really need to do is individualize it to yourself. If you're, if you want to be plant-based and you want to have eggs, it's okay. You can still be plant-based. So the idea that there are rules and restrictions is something that we want to get away from as a nutrition field, because when there are new restrictions like that, and people don't quote, follow them, then they feel like they're cheating. Then there's guilt associated with it. And we never want to have guilt associated with dietary intake. So that's why I have the note here. Be careful when reading something like this. And there is a documentary and a whole website called Forks Over Knives, which is the proponent of this plant-based diet. But again, just be very careful when you're watching something like that, because a lot of times it is one-sided and be very careful to have reputable resources on those uh, documentaries as well. So when we look for our plant-based diet, we'll be looking over here, which again, there's like mixed reviews on what you avoid and how strict you wanna follow the diet. So for example, the whole food plant-based diet would restrict or avoid oils and highly processed foods while including all of these whole grains, fruits, veggies, starches, vegetables, and legumes, which are gonna be really the cornerstone of these plant-based diets. So what we need to talk about now is something I talk about a lot in my undergrad classes, and that's being, uh, and I'm using quotes here because we don't really like to use the words good or bad, but good or bad vegetarians. And this kind of has been interesting in my research pattern because vegetarians are almost getting attacked by the plant-based diet, which I think is just really silly sort of, I don't know, marketing, media, I'm not sure. So the idea that you're a vegetarian, so you're eating nothing but French fries and pasta, but technically you're still a vegetarian because you're not eating animal-based products. And then the whole plant-based diet is the healthiest and better. 
But of course, I mean, you could find ways to make any dietary pattern healthy or unhealthy, depending on what you add into it. So a lot of times I do lecture in my undergrad classes about being a good versus a bad vegetarian, because there are a lot of college students who decide for weight restriction for perhaps underlying disordered eating that they're going to be a vegetarian because that's a good way to restrict intake. And in that case, they are eating just French fries, just pasta, just iceberg lettuce salads with no beans, no rich vegetables, no rich fruits that provide a lot of nutrients. So if you are going to take on a dietary pattern like this, you have to be very well attuned to make sure that you're getting enough calories and enough nutrients. So, and that's just looking at a comparison between how you can have two completely different looking salads when it comes to being a vegetarian. And actually this is shrimp, so a pescatarian. So a lot of times we look at these comparisons, again, sort of looking for calorically matched. This one is a little bit higher, about 100 calories higher, but you can say, are we considering the total calorie count? Or are we considering the nutrient breakdown? So if you have a lunch option for 450 calories, let's say, which would you choose? Which looks better to you? Are you in the mood to have a quick energy boost, a little bit of sodium and get on your way? Or do you really want something that's gonna take you much longer to eat? Will probably make you feel full. Think about eating two whole eggs and a half of an avocado. Like this is gonna fill someone up. And this is gonna hold the satiety longer because it does have the fiber. So comparing the two is something that you always need to think about when you are doing these plant-based options. All right, so our plant-based diet, here we go for the definition, means that foods are coming from plants, does not include any animal ingredients such as meat, milk, eggs, or honey. So those are those additional plant-based items that are like a secondary item. So milk, eggs, honey are things that are made from animals or animal products. So additionally, that secondary fold that goes into plant-based differing from vegetarianism is that you have those whole foods and also naturally minimally processed plant foods. So trying to do that whole approach. So here is how to follow the plant-based diet. And you can read through this and see the different types of fruits and vegetables. And I think that's pretty common for understanding a vegetarian or any sort of plant-based diet, but then really focusing in on things like tubers, which are going to be more energy dense, having those whole grains, which is important for fiber. It says even popcorn's a whole grain. Popcorn's actually one of the best whole grains um, in terms of proportions and why whole grains are important. We'll talk about that when we get to complementary protein. And then legumes. Legumes are a big one. A lot of times when people come to me and they say, I'm thinking about being a vegetarian or a vegan or following a plant-based diet. Let me get the first question out of my mouth is like, do you like beans? Do you like beans and do you like soy? If you like beans and soy, you're ready to go. If you can't stand those two foods, you're gonna have to, it's gonna be a lot tougher because those legumes and soy-based products do provide good energy density with a lot of micronutrients, and they are sort of the main, like the direct replacement for lean protein, if you think about that in terms of the uh, overall energy requirements and nutrient requirements. So here are some pictures of what comprises it. So again, the whole grains, the legumes, tubers, veggies, and fruit, and what a plate might look like with all of those different components. And you can find plenty of plant-based uh, grocery lists out there. I think what is interesting about trying a dietary pattern like this, even if it is for a short period of time, is you get to experience so many new foods and trying all these different vegetables that you've never tried before and figuring out how they work and what you like and what tastes good. And sometimes realizing that meat doesn't need to be as big of a dietary proportion as it is, which is a major problem for um, Americans right now and the proportion distortion when it comes to how much meat is actually required daily. And I'm happy to answer more questions about that as well. 
So this is a dietary pattern that if you are a longtime meat consumer may be difficult. And especially you might think like, I'm gonna be hungry, I'm not gonna have enough protein. These are all concerns. And it is a definite shift in the way that you think about food and the way that you plan for food. So the recommendation to follow this is gradual incorporation. So maybe you, instead of having three chicken thighs, you have one chicken thigh and one half cup of black beans. So it's the gradual incorporation of these plant-based protein sources into your diet. And if you usually do a cup of rice and a half cup of broccoli, switch to a half cup of rice and a full cup of broccoli. So making that slow transition, if you do it this way, this slow transition, you'll have more success. A lot of times we see participants struggle when they've been eating a traditional diet and all of a sudden they're just like, tomorrow it's only plant-based. It's nothing but tofu for me. And then we see a lot of failure. And again, I associate that failure with guilt and then we have yo-yo dieting. So it's something to always be aware of to slowly change. And in that case, you wanna do your research and make sure that you have everything that you need in order to meet your caloric needs because if you are hungry on a diet, that's gonna be another problem. And again, remember diet, dietary pattern, I'm speaking of the same thing here, not for weight loss. So smart shopping is another one. That's when it comes to the idea that these vegetable and bean sources can be taken in forms of canned, fresh, frozen. So understanding that you have everything that you need to have this dietary pattern, I definitely think this plant-based diet takes a lot of planning. So you do have to be ready um, to do that. And I also didn't put this in here, but following something like this is definitely a more expensive way to eat. I know meat is expensive, but having fresh fruits and vegetables all the time and making sure they're not bad is also something to consider. So that's why frozen and canned are a really good option. So one of the slow starts that we're gonna talk about is something that we always are proponents of in I Do at My House is Meatless Monday. So I'll talk about that at the end of the presentation here. Okay, so I wanna jumpstart health benefits with this case study, because I think this really shows the breadth and the amazing health benefits that following a true plant-based diet can be. So a 63 year old man presented at his primary care with fatigue, nausea, and muscle cramps. He had a previous history of hypertension, high cholesterol. And uh, at that visit, it was found that he had extremely high blood glucose within the 500s, which is very, very high and dangerous. So he was diagnosed with type two diabetes. But what's interesting about this particular case study is this man was not overweight or obese. He was at a normal weight. So from there, he was prescribed around six to eight medications to manage all of his different chronic diseases, but he was also given this new dietary pattern plant-based diet. So the plant-based diet that he was prescribed was also low sodium, which can be incorporated. Like, again, all of these diets are individualized. So for this person, low sodium because of his risk of heart disease was increased. Um, but again, most plant-based diets are lower in sodium. So it could have been one or the other. But he was prescribed a low sodium plant based diet, excluding all animal products, refined sugar, limited bread, rice and potatoes and tortillas to one serving a day. However, he was told you can have unlimited non starchy vegetables and those non starchy vegetables are going to be broccoli, carrots, um, kale, lettuce, um, and then the starchier ones are potatoes, legumes, tubers uh, and beans in order to follow this diet and also two ounces of nuts and seeds. So we had all the components of the plant-based diet and also told to begin exercising 15 minutes twice a day because we know that nutrition and exercise are best friends and we can't have one without the other. So what was the outcome of this dramatic intervention? 16 weeks, this man followed this study and at the end of those 16 weeks, he had decreased blood pressure, cholesterol, and glucose levels all to within normal ranges by diet and exercise alone. And he was reduced from those six to eight medications all the way down to one medication per day to manage his type 2 diabetes. 
What is again so interesting about this is it was not weight related as he was not overweight or obese to begin with and this saw no significant weight change in him. So it was truly his shift in dietary intake that had these amazing effects. Now, again, this is a very dramatic example because typically we would not see a person with that many chronic diseases without an issue of overweight or obesity. So why this is such an amazing case is because it does show the power of this diet on the chronic disease. Again, this is not saying that this will happen for everyone. We don't know how, how strict he was, but he was likely very strict with this diet. So because this has been shown to have such huge beneficial impacts on health, other chronic diseases that have been shown to be improved by following a plant-based diet or are obesity, which we know is a risk factor for a lot of chronic diseases, diabetes and heart disease, high blood pressure, which all have nutrition-related implications, to carbohydrates, fat, and sodium. And then overall mortality has shown to be lowered by following this plant-based diet. And I'm not even saying about this specific plant-based diet. Oh, I can definitely answer this question at the end. Okay, Make a note of that one, Vanessa. Sorry, I got sidetracked, okay. So, I didn't see that question. I might have gone just to you. So, um. oh, okay. I'll answer that one at the end, Nan. Thank you. All right. So, I got a little sidetracked there. So, why does the plant based diet have these implications on chronic disease improvement? Because this is an extremely nutrient rich diet. So, we go back to that idea of nutrient density. Because these foods that are incorporating this diet have a higher water content, their nutrients are really prevalent in what you get. So here we can see the food groups that follow, and we can just look in the vegan over here for all of these key nutrients that are supplied. We are seeing all of the micronutrients. And one of the biggest downfalls of a traditional diet is that you can get, especially in this day and age, is you can get all the required calories you need and still be deficient in micronutrients. And that's one of our biggest problems as a society right now is that we offer so many of these unhealthy uh, energy dense products. So there are so many different nutrients involved in a plant-based diet. Um, some of the highlights are gonna be antioxidants and antioxidants are primarily found in fruits and vegetables and they provide the vitamins and minerals, but the antioxidants are important because they help our body fight off any outside oxidation. So that's gonna be any basically cellular damage. And those antioxidants will prevent cellular damage and that's directly implicated in cancer prevention. Also rich sources of this word here, phytochemicals. And phyto, as you guys probably know, means plants. And chemicals are those plant chemicals that are not essential. So they don't fall under that definition of if we don't have them, we're gonna see symptoms, but they have been shown to have additional properties. So like one of my personal research areas is with lutein and zeaxanthin, which are two phytochemicals found in eggs that are directly related to age-related macular degeneration. So, and known to be potent protectors of the macula of the eye. I'm also big into eggs. That's one of my research areas as well. So any and all egg questions are always welcome. Also, this diet is high in fiber. And if you take my classes on campus, you are sick of hearing me talk about fiber because all I do is talk about the benefits of fiber. It is important for GI health. And in an age where IBS is becoming, that's uh, irritable bowel syndrome, is becoming such a common problem, that's a mixture, or depending on which type you have, of diarrhea and constipation, fiber is so important in regulating GI function. So most Americans are deficient in fiber, and following a plant-based diet is like fiber galore. And it's all that natural, soluble fiber, so those outside um, peels, so like on an apple or on a potato, and also a lot of the fruits and vegetables in general. Also, this diet is naturally lower in saturated fat and cholesterol, which increased intakes of those is associated with heart disease, cardiovascular disease. So 
overall a lot of benefits. Now we have to talk about the other side of the coin. So the health concerns that are related to this. And these are mostly related to when you're following this diet, but you're not following it well. And that's when we start to tiptoe into those lots of very pasta heavy meals or different sorts of meals that aren't really following the guidelines. And that's usually getting away from our legumes, tubers, and our precious soy when it comes to these diets. So we'll talk about protein quality and risk of nutrient deficiency. All right, so protein quality is something that is definitely needs to be considered when you're talking about plant-based, but also when you're talking about animal-based as well. So this is broken down basically into the protein's ability to support body growth and maintenance, which is protein's main job in our body. We don't want to use protein for energy if we can avoid it because carbohydrates and fat love to become energy. So we want to save protein for all of the other jobs in the body, such as growth and maintenance. It's a huge component of cellular membranes, enzymatic activity all throughout our body. So protein has to be consumed every day. It's not something that we can store. So we have to have it every day. That's how it falls under the definition of essential. So protein falls into these three categories, digestibility, how easily we can break it down, amino acid composition, what amino acids, which are the building blocks of these proteins are comprised in this food, and then whether they are a complete or incomplete protein, which you may have heard those words before. So let's get into it. Digestibility of protein is broken down into biological value. And that's how well the protein is converted into body tissue protein. So some of these proteins are very easily digestible, very easily broken down, and some are locked into other um, phytochemicals or items that may make them more difficult to be broken down. And when you think about digestibility, you can think about cracking a raw egg into a pan and having it go from that clear goo into a more stable white. That's going to be the breakdown of those proteins and how quickly that can occur. It's the same things happening in your body. It's called denaturation. Sometimes it's reversible. Sometimes it's not in an egg to a frying pan. That's going to be irreversible denaturation, but our body does reversible denaturation. So breaking it down and then building it back up to use it again. So the difference between digestibility when it comes to animal and plant proteins is well established. So about 90 to 100% of animal protein is digested and able to be used by our body, where only about 70% of plant protein is able to be digested and used in our body. So even if we eat something that says on the label, 30 grams of protein in this plant-based item, 30 grams of protein in this animal-based item, we'll take in only 70, about 70% 70 of that protein from the plant where we're taking in 90 to 100 coming from the animal source. And that really is one of the tricks of the nutrition label is just because you see it on the nutrition label doesn't mean that's what actually gets into our body. And that could take us on a whole other tangent to bioavailability, which is something completely different that we'll talk about another day. So the next thing we'll talk about is complete versus incomplete protein. And this is one of the biggest concerns for a plant-based diet. So a complete protein will have all nine essential amino acids. Now I already talked about amino acids being the building blocks of protein. And there are two categories. Well, and there's technically three. The first category is an essential amino acid. And that falls under the definition of essentiality for nutrients, meaning we have to get it from our diet. If we don't get it from our diet, we're gonna have some sort of symptoms that can occur. So for example, you can have pinpoint hemorrhaging in the face or um, discoloration of the eyes or GI bleeding that can come from these lack of appropriate essential amino acids. Then we have non-essential amino acids. And these are amino acids that our body is able to create on its own. So you don't have to consume these. A complete protein will contain all nine essential amino acids and all 11 non-essential amino acids in one food. Um, these are going to be all animal sources except gelatin that fall within this complete protein. And actually another plug for eggs, 
eggs are the highest quality and most complete protein available. They have a rating of one, which is the highest rating that a protein can get. Now we have our incomplete protein. This is going to mean that it's missing at least one or more essential amino acid. And when you are missing one essential amino acid and not getting it from the diet, that's when these symptoms can start to occur. And that's when the body will start to have harm. So all plant products are considered incomplete proteins, except for soy, which I've been plugging, and quinoa which has become exceedingly popular in the last 10 years. So those are our two plant-based proteins that do meet the definition of complete. So what do we do when something's incomplete? That's where the plant-based diet has to get crafty and it is called a complementary protein. So complementary proteins are actually quite interesting and they have a rich history of how they've come to be and why human evolution is so interesting. So over here on the right, you'll see a picture of rice and beans. Rice and beans are complementary proteins that make a complete protein food. And we know that rice and beans is a staple of Central and Southern Latin American um, communities. So over time, it was determined without even knowing hundreds of thousands of years ago, what protein completeness was that rice and beans needed to be consumed together to meet that protein essentiality, complete protein food. So here are some examples of how to make complementary food for protein combinations. And again, you'll see a couple of other things that you may notice culturally are really um, put together quite often. So hummus and pita bread, for example. That's another one, red beans and rice, which we already talked about. And I actually have another example here on this slide of showing some complementary protein dishes. So if I am counseling someone who's interested in doing a plant-based diet, then I would make sure that they understand complementary proteins and they're aware of how to get all of the essential amino acids. Because as always in nutrition, we'd like for you to be getting those essential amino acids from food-based sources rather than from supplemental sources. I'm going to come back to that beans question, if we can make a note about that. All right, so now that brings us on to soy. So as I mentioned, soy is a complete protein. And again, why I often ask people, do you like soy? Because you definitely need to get it going. Um, anybody out there on the chat, big fan of soy? Uh, or any of the soy-based foods? So we have some examples here. Plain tofu, which I think is the bomb because it tastes almost like nothing. So you can make it taste like anything. Um, and it's just one of those things that you kind of, and Sage will make a note to talk about this. If you are a soy person, can you just learn how to use this product and you really can find out how uh, versatile it is. Okay, Vanessa likes tempeh, yeah. So tempeh is on here. As well as the substitute for meat and sandwiches and casseroles. Um, we have soy nuts for a great snack. Let's see, soft tofu with veggies. Yep, I have a friend who really um, she uses the baby food warmer to heat up the the tofu. Her kids love it. I know they're eating that a lot. So we have soy milk also, which is an alternative. So if you are following a plant based diet, then you're unlikely to be drinking cow's milk. So soy milk is. Although we know that soy milk is not a direct equivalent to a cow's milk. And while it may be fortified with things like calcium, vitamins, and minerals, that they're not going to be absorbed the same way that they are from cow's milk. So remember, that's another thing. Just because it's listed on the label that it has the same amount doesn't mean it's going to be absorbed the same way in your body. And that goes again into bioavailability and sort of absorbing fat soluble vitamins with fat and a talk for another day. Oh, I am gonna talk about this right now. Soy being a risk factor for breast cancer, good question. So for a long time, it was unknown if soy was a risk factor for breast cancer. Yep, absolutely. So that's been something that has been researched extensively and we cannot say with complete certainty that it is not related, however, most of the primary research has shown that there is not a relationship. So in that case, we don't 
necessarily recommend against consuming soy products. Now, I wouldn't, what is also, I've been saying nutrition so individualized. If you are someone who knows that you have perhaps the BRCA1 gene, which is a gene that's directly associated with breast cancer development, and you didn't want to put any risk in your body, I would suggest consuming lower amounts of soy. Actually, my friend who I was just speaking about, whose child, um, whose children eat a lot of soy, she does have BRCA1 and she still consumes soy because the data is showing that it is not related to breast cancer development. So that's what we say at this time. Okay, let me see. Oh, that's a loaded question. When I say soy, do I assume organic non-GMO? Um, no. And that's another talk for another day. If you wanna get into organic and non-GMO, most of the soy in this country is going to be GMO. And as a field, we have no problems with GMO foods in terms of nutritional health. And remember, I'm always coming from a place of nutrition. GMO soy and non-GMO soy are identical when it comes to terms of nutrition. Yep, there we go. Sherry, agreed. We're on the same page. That's what the data is showing at this time. And that's a pretty broad, that's a very well-researched area for the last 10 or 15 or even more years. So a lot here on soy to think about. Okay. So our nutrients of concern, as I just mentioned, this is very nutrient rich, but because of the issues with complementary protein, as well as the availability and bioavailability and intake of nutrients, there are nutrients of concern associated with these diets. So the possible um, concerns here in vegetarian diets and plant-based are gonna be low amounts of vitamin B12, which is a water-soluble B vitamin, but acts quite similarly to a fat-soluble vitamin, and vitamin D, iron, zinc, and calcium, omega-3 fatty acids, certain essential amino acids, and then overall energy, which again, these are usually seen in children. So here's why those outcomes are worrisome. So protein deficiency is not something that we typically see in this country. It is seen quite often in developing countries, but we will see the protein deficiency if someone is following a bad vegetarian diet and is consuming primarily pasta, salads. Um, we do see it again with the complementary protein um, mistakes as well. So just something to be aware of there, but likely Americans are not protein deficient, because there are still, I mean, if you are consuming soy, if you are consuming beans, there's going to be a lot of protein in there as well. Uh, energy under consumption of required calories due to dietary restrictions is associated with switching to a different dietary pattern and also if it is for weight loss. So as a person consumes less calories, their body will require less calories for energy and slowing the whole body can be associated with fatigue. So that is something uh, to be considering. And also if an individual is not getting enough protein, then the body will, I'm sorry, not getting enough energy, the body will turn to protein to make energy. And that process is called gluconeogenesis. It's not something that you want your body to be doing quite often because you wanna save protein for all of the processes that it has to do in the body. Other areas of concern will be iron especially for women of childbearing age who have the normal monthly menses and who are losing that blood every month. Um, so iron intake with a low protein or low animal-based protein diet is something to consider and something that we're always going to be aware of if I'm seeing any person of any woman of childbearing age who is following a plant-based diet. Vitamin B12, as I mentioned, is a water-soluble vitamin that behaves like a fat-soluble vitamin, and it is very important to the development of red blood cells. So without sufficient vitamin B12, there can be something called macrocytic anemia and nerve damage, which can definitely cause long-term problems. That's probably the most common deficiency that we see with following a vegetarian diet. And even if you are following it really, really well, sometimes it just still occurs the body may just not be adapting without the animal protein. 
We also see calcium and vitamin D deficiency. However, just to note, most Americans are deficient in vitamin D, especially where we live in this country. So this can be associated with low bone mineral density and fractures over time. And this is if this deficiency is for a very long time. And then lastly, the reduction of fat in, in the plant-based diet may really uh, reduce the intake of essential fatty acids, which is omega-3 and omega-6. Omega-6 is unlikely to be deficient, but omega-3, which one of the best sources is fish and other fatty foods and really specific nuts and seeds, is more likely to be deficient. And that could be seen in skin, hair, and nail abnormalities, but also having underlying nerve damage. So definitely something to be concerned with and aware of. So when we talk about protein as a whole and where it comes from, uh, it's actually the most individualized macronutrient in our diet. So we usually have recommendations for all Americans within the ages of like four to 85 for carbohydrates and fat, but protein is individualized for a healthy individual at 0 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. So everyone has their own individual protein recommendation, which is why this is very tough to give a general consensus to. Um, it does comprise anywhere from 10 to 35% of your total calorie intake, which is a huge range. It's much bigger than the other macronutrients. And if you wanna take time to do your own protein calculation, you can go ahead and do that. In order to get, if you know your weight in pounds to kilograms, you just divide by 2.2 and then multiply by 0.8 if you want to get an idea of where you are. And on that, I say the caveat, uh, add and subtract 10% and give yourself a little range. If you want to do your calculation, I'm happy to help with that. All right, so that brings us to our summary of the plant-based diet here, that it is a very, it requires a lot of work to do a diet like this in terms of planning, reading labels, shopping, thinking about complementary proteins, thinking about micronutrients, making sure that you have all of this, especially if you're coming from a traditional animal-based diet. You have to be willing to consume lots of fruits and vegetables, lots of beans, legumes, seeds, nuts, whole grains. And if you wanna go truly plant-based, avoiding or limiting those processed foods, carbohydrates, and added fats. If you are looking for the health benefits of this, it has been associated with reducing chronic conditions, lowering body weight, and decreasing risk of cancer and heart disease. So that is our overall summary. Now let's say you're ready to give it a shot. What should you do? Let's say after this, you're like, yeah, I might try it. Do I need meat? Maybe, I don't know. So our dietetics field recommends meatless Mondays. And this is something that we've been doing for a long time. And basically that means on Mondays, you try to reduce all animal products, or if you wanna just do animal products and then keep fish and eggs and dairy, whatever you wanna do. Again, it's flexible, nothing that you need to stand by. Um, here are some suggestions of what you can do. And again, thinking about meeting those protein requirements and having everything to have full variety in your diet. So maybe something, anybody wanna give it a shot? Meatless Monday today? Can we do it? Vanessa's doing it? Okay, there we go. I'll probably be meatless Monday, but OVO. Can't live without my eggs, can't do it. So now I'm ready for any additional questions. I can answer the ones that came through. I think there are two. <laughs> Meat only Mondays, nice. There we go. Sage will flips the script. Actually, before I take questions, Sage, why don't you jump on? Um, we're lucky enough to have Sage here, who is our real life plant based guru, so she can talk about real that. Life. Real <laughs> life. Hi, everybody. Amanda, you are such a great educator. Thank you so much for talking about this topic. Hi, everyone. I'm raising so many faces. I've got Nan staring right at me, so I have to, of course, say, Hi to Nan. Um, this has been really, really great. And what I appreciate so much, right, is that, you know, I think a lot of us have been hearing a little bit of this information and some of us have, you know, taken the step to watch these documentaries. And, and I think sometimes it can feel very much like we're being targeted. Um, and I really, really appreciate that you, you know, what I appreciate educators giving this information so we can have a conversation and not feel so pigeonholed into our thoughts and our opinions and just 
you know, realize that we're all different. Our bodies are all different. We all live in different parts of the world. There's a million and one ways to lose weight. There's a million and one ways to just have a, a lifestyle. So this has been really great. Um, I guess I, I don't, you know, I don't have a ton to add. I learned a lot. I'm not a nutritionist. I just know that I really love fruits and vegetables. Um, and I guess just backing up, I, I grew up, um, a vegetarian. Both my parents were very strict vegetarians. My dad is from, um, India. And like you said, one of those reasons are religious reasons. And, um, he belonged to a, a very strict religion called, uh, Jain or Jainism and, uh, very, very strict, um, mostly vegan, depending on how strictly you follow. And then, um, yeah, so I was raised a vegetarian and it wasn't until I moved to um, Rhode Island um, at URI, I graduated from URI, that I sort of kind of considered a, adding seafood into my diet, just looking at how closely this protein source was for us, um, how many wonderful sustainable things our fishermen are doing um and i started dabbling in that world a little bit um and then fast forward a couple more years to having a family who we chose to raise vegetarian um early on um at least with my older son but then with kylan i think right around uh when he was two we made the switch uh, very cliche we saw a documentary and we were inspired. We saw the movie Veducated, and we said, you know what? What's what's three to six months out of um, our lives trying to go completely vegan? And we did. And what ended up being six months is now um, it ended up being uh, six months. We we did it about a year because it went really really well. Um, my son, and this is I'm just speaking for us, our own anecdotal experiences. I'm not, of course, a, a doctor, and I'm not going to give out any of that information. But my little guy, Kylan, was on allergy meds constantly, and I always had eczema. I've never gone a day in my life without eczema until we did make that switch. And up until this day, I really don't know which one was my trigger, if it was dairy or if it were eggs. But I'm too scared to go back at this point um, because it has worked so well for us. Um, and around that year mark of being completely vegan, my husband and I just kind of had this conversation once. We were like, you know, what do we really miss? And we we honestly thought it was going to be cheese because we were really addicted to cheese. I know. Um, never thought that I would be five years later not not eating cheese. But it honestly was seafood for us. Um, it was oysters. We love our oysters. And we love the relationship that we had with some of our, our fisher friends and bartering our homegrown veggies for oysters and things like that. Um, so it's sort of, you know, morphed from being this thing where my parents raised me a certain way and then kind of growing up with my own ideals and having animal welfare tucked in there a little bit, you know, that that kind of sticks with me from just how I was raised from my father. But then just, you know, kind of seeing some of the seafood aspect being a sustainable source of protein, you know, we can get into these deep discussions about how much water it takes for these almond trees. Um, and then, you know, all this almond milk we're drinking. So we wanted to be able to really round out where we were getting our protein sources, I guess. Um, so, yeah, um, I think you wanted me to mention a couple things. I tried to keep track of them. Um, yeah, so tofu tips, like, yeah, so we we check all those buckets. We love beans, we love legumes. I'm half Indian, how can I not like lentils and dal, of, of course, all of those things. Um, and tofu, yeah, I mean, we do. I mean, tofu's pretty tasteless, right? Um, but oddly enough, my kids still really love it and they'll eat it plain without doing anything to it. Um, but we have really worked to uh, cook with tofu. Um, my kids love scrambled tofu. We do a little turmeric to give it that yellow egg light look. Um, we use something called namuk, which is a black Himalayan salt that really smells like rotten eggs. So a titch of that can really give you that, that egg taste. I know you love Amanda. Um, so yeah, tofu finds its way. And another thing that wasn't mentioned um, in this talk is something called seitan, which is another way you can make it at home, a protein source. Its main component is vital wheat gluten. Um, so it comes from bread. Um, we do have someone in our family that has celiac, so we don't need it as much as we would like because then she can't uh, partake in that meal with us. Um, and seitan has a lot of selenium and iron. Um, so that's a really great thing that's sometimes hard to hard to find in those plant-based diets. Um, we mentioned B12 um, for us. Uh, we eat a lot of mushrooms, which are one of the few 
that has B12, um, like a lot of mushrooms, but if you like mushrooms, try to find a way to get those into your diet, as well as nutritional yeast. Um, if you haven't heard of nutritional yeast, it also has fortified, usually with a lot of those vitamin Bs, it has this oddly cheesy taste to it. That's how we make the base of our, you know, once in a while we like to have comfort food and mac and cheese, and we'll make it from pureeing tofu nutritional yeast. And yeah, so we found all these hacks. Um, and I think we live in this glorious time where, um, you know, we have access to a lot of a lot of these DIY Pinterest type things and how to substitute food if you're missing something at home. And yeah, so we're I don't think we fall into any one of the buckets that you mentioned, Amanda. And I think that that's OK. I think that. Mm -hmm. You know, the way I'm eating right now might look very different in a year from now or five years from now. I really consider ourselves holistic eaters and trying to eat with our ecosystem and make sustainable decisions along the way. That's great. Thank you so much. Sure. 